104.5 The Team and 104.5 The Team.com. Brady and Goss in for LeVac and Wolf today on the phone with Dan Rayfield. He's a, a boxing writer and commentator for ESPN. You can follow him on Twitter at Dan Rayfield ESPN. Dan, before we get to boxing, you're a Shen alum, grad, uh, graduating class of 88. I'm 2008. Did you see Shen baseball captured a state title and had two players drafted this year? Pretty cool stuff for us. That is absolutely tremendous. I mean, look, when I used to still live in the area, and uh, obviously I'm a graduate of Shen, but I also covered Shenandoah sports for several years when I worked in Saratoga at the Saratoga newspaper, covered a lot of Shen baseball and, you know, some good teams, teams that won sectional finals and, you know, were, were winning, uh, winning division titles and, and competing at the highest level of the state, but not a state t- championship. That's tremendous. And obviously they had the talent to do it. They had two kids drafted. So I, when I heard about that, I was really, I was excited. I mean, I haven't followed uh, much of the local scene for a long time since I haven't been in the area, but uh, it's great to hear. And uh, I'm going to have to check with my mom who lives in Clifton Park and see if she heard about it. Shen now has the best baseball team in New York State class. Double A. Congratulations to them. Congratulations to the Plainsmen. But this weekend, I was telling these guys at the station that we may see the fight of the year at the Turning Stone Casino and Resort this Saturday night. You were there. I was also there in attendance Paroknikov versus Molina Dan did it live up to the hype was that the fight of the year this weekend I mean it was not the fight of the year I don't think anybody's going to say it was in fact the previous week I was at a fight that was on HBO in Carson California between Orlando Salido and uh, the junior lightweight title holder Francisco Vargas they put on the fight of the year by by clear uh, you know by anybody's determination it seems to me uh, uh, the week before but a lot of people thought that maybe Marlena and Provodnikov could be in the conversation because both of those guys have been in a number of exciting fights during their careers they both have been participants in a past recent fight of the year and so you match them together you figure you're going to get fireworks and although you did get fireworks it, it didn't quite live up to the level of fight of the year but it was still a one heck of a, vo- a good exciting entertaining fight if you tuned in on Showtime if you bought a ticket at the Turning Stone uh, you definitely got your money's worth because not only was that a very good fight uh but you got a good a good card to go with it you know the, the rest of the supporting bouts were mostly interesting also so it was a, it was a great night of fights at turning stone and you know capped off by the fact that turning stone is only about 15 minutes away from the international boxing hall of fame which held their annual induction ceremonies on sunday and also had a big basically boxing party weekend because of the hall of fame induction so being able to travel up the turning stone cover an excellent card on Saturday, spend some time at the Hall of Fame on Saturday during the day before the boxing event, and then head over to the induction ceremonies to cover them on Sunday. It was a great boxing weekend, as far as I'm concerned, all taking place in upstate New York. You bring up that great weekend. Yesterday was the induction ceremony. You had a chance to visit the Hall of Fame. For those who have not had a chance to go there, what are some of your favorite parts, and also what do you take away from this ceremony yesterday, some of your favorite moments from that as well? Well, listen, the Hall of Fame, is, if, you, if you're a boxing fan and you've never been, I mean, I encourage every boxing fan, put that on your bucket list, especially if you're living in, in the area, in the Albany area, Clifton Park, you know, in that capital region, and you don't go out to see the Hall of Fame, then you're just doing yourself a disservice. It's not too far away, quick, easy drive. Uh, you know, look, the museum is small. But you can only spend a couple hours there. There's a tremendous amount of history. But I would say go on induction weekend because there's so much other things going on besides just uh, seeing the museum and the induction ceremony. The induction ceremony is fantastic. Obviously, it depends on which uh, people are being inducted, if you're fans of those people or not. But it's just a joy to be there because it's just so much boxing history, so many people uh, to talk to. Everybody's so friendly. The staff at the Hall of Fame is tremendous. Um, a lot of interesting things to look at. They have a lot of activities. They have the big champions banquet. They have a really cool parade with the champions that, that winds through town on Sunday before the inductions. I had a great time on Saturday. They have uh, about, I don't know, maybe like maybe a half a mile, if that, quarter mile from the Hall of Fame down the street in the town is the Canastota High School. Uh, and they host in their gymnasium, they have a boxing collector show. So if you're familiar with going to like a baseball card show, this is like that, but it's all boxing stuff, posters, programs, old ring magazines, record books, you know, uh, hardcover old books, uh, you name it, autographs, gloves, you know, old hats and shirts from fights, just all kinds of great stuff. I'm a collector, so I went over there and uh, had a great time, found some posters to add to my collections, but also you get to see people talk boxing, meet fans, you know, meet all kinds of boxing people. It's just, it's so much fun. It's like, I would encourage everybody to do it. And it don't, you know, the, the, the cost to get in is, it's pretty cheap. It's maybe like five or 10 bucks. It's really, it's just totally worth it to spend the day there. Uh, the ceremony was great because some of the people that were inducted 
are people who I have become close to over my, my uh, career covering boxing. So, you know, even though they're maybe the most famous fighters necessarily, but like people from myself, like the broadcaster, Colonel Bob Sheridan, getting inducted, a very close friend of mine, was wonderful to see him. Uh, Mark Radner, who was uh, the longtime executive director of the Nevada Commission, probably one of the most respected people uh, in boxing when he was working in the sport. Just a great guy to see him get inducted. You know, my good pal Harold Letterman from HBO, but really is being inducted for his, his great work for decades as a, as a boxing judge. Um, but then to just see the fighters who are being inducted, so excited. People like Lupe Pinter, you know, great former champion, and, and uh, Hilario Zapata, uh, get a big kiss on his forehead from Roberto Duran, who was there, who was one of his dear friends. I mean, just so many great memories every time seeing uh, Sugar Ray Leonard and Marvin Hagler sitting basically next to each other uh, on the stage. Um, you know, there were some poignant moments. Hector Camacho Jr., accepting the induction for his father who was uh, killed a few years ago so there was some sadness there but he also you know brought things to life when he got up and sounded just like his father and started yelling to the crowd what time is it and everybody responded as you would expect it's macho time uh, it was just a great day dan rayfield capital region native with us on 104.5 the team 104.5 the team.com it's Slovak and wolf brady and Gaz in for the guys today dan Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather. Is this fight going to happen? And what do you think the <laughs> dynamics would be if it actually did happen? Could, does it have the potential to be a competitive fight even? Well, first of all, no, it doesn't. Second of all, it's not <laughs> going to happen. And it's interesting because at the Hall of Fame yesterday, sitting directly behind me, was Lorenzo Fertitta, who was the chairman and CEO of UFC, as well as Dana White, who's the president of UFC. Uh, people who I, I know over the years, and uh, I was you know, joking around with Dana about that fight, and, you know, he said, that fight's never going to happen. You know, and I made the point because Conor had just signed uh, a fight for one of the upcoming UFC pay-per-views to fight uh, Nick Diaz. Uh, you know, and so I was kind of joking around with Dana. I said, oh, I guess that means the Mayweather fight's not going to happen now that he just uh, signed for that fight in the UFC announced it. And Dana, like, you know, slapped me on the back and was laughing. He goes, ah, oh, come on, that fight was never going to happen. He knows, <laughs> look, it's interesting for people to talk about fantasy fights. It's not a realistic fight. Would it make money? Obviously, I guess it would because there's a lot of dummies out there that would buy it. But the reality is you have the best boxer in the world in Floyd Mayweather, if he exits his retirement, would essentially be fighting Conor McGregor, who is obviously an outstanding fighter in his mixed martial arts sport. But if he comes over to boxing, you're basically talking about the best fighter in the world making his professional debut, uh, or rather the best boxer in the world taking on a, a fighter making his professional debut. It's a mismatch. I have talked to people at different commissions in the United States you know, where they don't want to talk about it on the record, but just to gauge their thought about that kind of situation. And most of them would say, we're not, we would not, we probably would not license that kind of fight. So I think they would have a difficult time finding a reputable place to actually have the fight, much less actually make the fight. I mean, it's just, it's so silly. It ain't going to happen. Connor's going to stay in MMA and make tons of money. Floyd may come back and box again, make tons of money. They'll probably continue to use each other's names to gain uh, some uh, publicity like we're giving them right now. But to think that they actually will fight in a real legitimate fight in a boxing ring, not going to happen in my opinion. Dan, we'll get you out of here on this. I know the the public has been inundated with Muhammad Ali's stories and and, and introspectives over the last week, but curious if, if you've had any interaction with Ali personally, if you have any stories, and if you haven't, just kind of what your overall remembrance of his legacy is. Well, I mean, like anybody that's a boxing fan, you just have a certain love for Muhammad Ali. I mean, what he did for the sport, just his place in the history, just, you know, obviously one of the greatest, if not the greatest fighter of all time. Um, my personal interactions with him were very limited. Now, I did cover a number of fights that his daughter, Layla, participated in. She was uh, coming into the pro ranks pretty much around the same time that I was starting my career. So I wrote, you know, a number of stories about her and met her and knew her and her team a bit. Uh, the one time that I had uh, the privilege to meet Muhammad Ali in person was actually shortly after I started my career as the boxing writer for USA Today. This was in June 2000, uh, a couple of nights before the first fight between Oscar De La Hoya and Shane Mosley, which was taking place at the Staples Center in Los Angeles. And a couple of nights before that fight, uh, Leila Ali had a, had a main event at a smaller venue in Los Angeles, and they kind of was sort of a big deal locally because it was her first fight of her career that was taking place in her hometown because she was born and raised in Los Angeles. So I went to that event with some of the other reporters that were there to cover the De La Hoya Shane Mosley fight. And when I was backstage uh, prior to the show, I was introduced to Muhammad Ali. And I wrote a little bit about that in a column that I, that I wrote after he passed away. And it was, you know, it was brief, but he was obviously very nice and smiled and, you know, put his arm around me. And I was kind of, as I wrote in the column, I was embarrassed. He said something to me. But at that point, even then, his speech was not very good. It was very low. You could not make out. He didn't talk a whole lot. 
So whatever he said to me, I never actually heard, and I was too embarrassed to ask him to repeat it because, you know, obviously he was having problems speaking. And I was like, okay, I'll just let it slide. So I smiled, but it was, you know, it was great to just be in the presence of greatness even for a brief period of time. But the thing I remember besides just my personal meeting with him is many times over the course of my career, because Ali would come to major fights. And even if he wasn't being introduced by the ring announcer or by the PA system, at some point the people in the crowd would realize, here comes Muhammad Ali going to ringside. And inevitably, no matter where you were, the whole crowd would just break into the Ali Ali chance. And that was always exciting. It was always electric when that would happen. Dan Rayfield, ESPN boxing writer and commentator. Follow him on Twitter, at Dan Rayfield ESPN. Breaks down everything in the ring for us. And then also uh, a little little trip down memory lane, the Shen graduate here, and I reveling in the Plainsman State Baseball Championship. <laughs> Dan, thanks for being with us. We appreciate the time. Always my pleasure. Let's go, Plainsman.